kind of went numb for a few minutes because I couldn't quite take it in. He'd got lung cancer and I could feel the tears coming and I went to give him a great big hug. It was only a matter of days before our 47th wedding anniversary at that point and it was within days of that diagnosis that together we faced the fact that it could be terminal though we were hoping that it wasn't going to be soon that chemotherapy could extend his life and in the beginning you hope that you will get back to doing all you did before and it takes time to realize that you can't do things in the same way that you used to you keep on hoping that maybe you'll be able to get up in the loft to use your model railway again, which has been one of Graham's hobbies. And there have been times when we've both got frustrated because he can't do something and I can't do it either. But you learn that you can get over frustrations. But as time's gone on, I've had to do more and more for Graham. And the next stage is that he's got to be helped out of bed to sit on a commode. And somehow, six months ago, when it all started, he would have hated the thought of that happening. And somehow he's closed the door on his activities. He still thought about them. He still thought about the fun we've had on the boat in the past. He's thought about the occasions with when we've had happy family occasions and we've relived them through talking about them. And actually tears can, can help sometimes, I think. Yes. You know, having oh, a good yes. old weep. Well, sometimes right. it really does help. Oh, I'm sure you You know, rather than always being oh, brave and yes. holding it in. Kay Garlic, the vicar, came to see us fairly early on and asked if we would like communion at home. And Graham said, yes, please. And month by month, Kay talked us through looking back on chapters of our life and looking forward, perhaps, to the next chapter, which was going to be a very different chapter for both of us. I've, I've never seen an MRI scan before. And then to my eye, as soon as I looked at that image, I could see this wasn't a slip disc. The bone on her back was a totally different colour to every other bone you could see. We then knew this is sinister. And it was like a slap in the face when the, the consultant said to us, I'm referring you as an emergency to oncology. Because we both knew oncology is cancer. But as we were going home, like, it hadn't sunk in whatsoever. I was just sitting there, total silence. And um, I think that's when it really did hit me, was when I just... I just had tears coming down because, well, I heard mum crying and I just, I realised obviously this is really bad. And because um, she used to tell me, um, oh, Danny, if there is something more to this, and I used to stop her then and say, no, there isn't, it is a slipped disc. And I keep it like that because I used to cry when I thought a, a parent getting anything like this. So um, when I found out, I just, I just didn't want to hear it. I just didn't want to know. I don't think there is phases, it's all clumped together and it'll all come at the same time. You all get upset and angry and you're denying it. It's, it goes on, it's just, I think gradually it eases, but you get all these emotions, they're all happening to you at the same time. You don't get like a week of denial and a week of something else. No. It's every day you're going through the same emotions and they're always there. You know, you, you might be really happy and jovial one minute, and the slightest thing irritates you and you just fly off the handle. And you think, well, that isn't me. Like, he's a grown man. He's strong and everything like that. But we don't care. We we want him to cry. We want him to show that he's got emotion. And we we already know that he has from little things that he said to us. So he can show it all if he wants to. So it's just fine. My whole life revolved around Ken. We'd been together 
15 years, everything I did, everything I thought of was for Ken. But because Ken was so much older than I was, we knew that we obviously had a limited time together. So we had as many holidays as we could. Pictures in Madeira, Ken, pictures everywhere of Ken. The dogs were a huge part of our life. And music, classical music, was a massive part of Ken's life. He was hugely passionate about music and taught me so much about it. He started off in the beginning having stomach pains. It got so bad in the end, the pains, that I took Ken down to a &E and they came back and said that they needed to keep him overnight. And the next morning they um, said they needed to talk to us both. They told us then that it was cancer of the pancreas. It, the tumour was so large that it had pushed on the spleen and that's what the pain was. Both Ken and I looked at each other and said, that's okay, we'll deal with it. That's not a problem. We've conquered other things. We'll get through it. And the consultant said, no, yeah, I'm not gonna get through this one. It's, it's, it's not gonna happen. When my wife Janet was first diagnosed as having some sort of a, a lump, it was described, in her head, even at that point, we had no idea as to the seriousness and the eventual outcome of, of what she was suffering from. It wasn't until she eventually went into Birmingham Neurological Hospital and had an, an emergency operation, and the stark reality was then explained to us afterwards that she was terminally ill, that they couldn't do anything further for her, that we were suddenly hit by this great horror, transforming us from an ordinary, normal life into one that we could not possibly have imagined before. I think the, the reality was that there was many things that we would do together or that were connected that would never happen again. And that was quite a shock that you realised that you had the time to think about these situations, that everyday little things like getting in the firewood for the fire, going to town shopping, feeding the livestock and all those things were never going to happen again. And that still is one of the difficult things to accept. We were suddenly plunged into a new world, a world of terminology and descriptions of things we had no idea what they actually meant, medical jargon that we didn't understand. And it was a huge learning curve of unimaginable proportions. There was things like we needed to consult the palliative care unit. And I confess, although I'd heard the word in the past, I had no idea what a palliative care unit was or what they did or how they could help me. And eventually, we unraveled a lot of these mysteries. The questions that I asked were answered clearly, and it took quite a while until we got enough information together that we then knew we could cope with bringing Janet home and uh, looking after her here. Initially, just my sons and myself, with a little bit of daytime care, but we needed to be sure that as the situation developed and we wanted further support, whether it be medically or nursing or caring, that it was available to us and we could call on it as and when we wanted it. There was times when I needed a little bit extra help in particular or there was complications and I wasn't sure what I should do about it, particularly with the medication and there was always somebody at hand on the phone somewhere that I could ring to seek their advice and their guidance, even if it was at two o'clock in the morning 